All right, welcome back, my friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Ken, Ed, Cameron, we are here. Kristen was not able to be here today, uh, but today we are going to try to keep this discussion to like 20 minutes uh, and talk about the Disney Studios. And what I named this, what's wrong with the Disney Studios, kind of a misnomer because my whole thing is that there's not actually a lot wrong with the Disney Studios. I know that everybody's saying that Pixar's on the net. I know that everybody's saying like Marvel's doing bad. I know that there's a lot of stuff about Lucasfilm and all these things. But really, if you look at the numbers, Disney is leading the global box office this year, $3.4 billion. Um, Universal is second with $2.89 billion. Uh, and then Illumination is uh, down at like uh, 1.3 billion. Um, uh, oh, sorry, that's part of Universal, obviously, but you know, propel propelled by like Super Mario Brothers. Um, Disney's global take this far. Listen to this. Disney's global take this far, three point nine is 3.9 times higher than Paramount's. It's 3.8 times what Warner Brothers has. It is 3.1 times what Sony has. Um, and it's more than if you combine Paramount and Warner Brothers, you combine them, Disney is still far ahead. Um, the, let's see. Uh, and all of this is coming from uh, Fortune. Uh, so I, I probably should have put it up here so I could share my screen. But anyways, um, you know, number one at the stateside box office, um, leading the U.S. Canada box office ahead of Universal, Sony, Paramount, Warner Brothers, all of these things, Disney is still leading. So I want to start the discussion there. If we think that something is wrong with Disney, it has to be something with the larger industry. We cannot just talk about Disney. Um, I'm going to go to Ed first. Tell me what you think. Is there a problem with Disney right now? Uh, well, there are problems with Disney. I don't think, but like you said, I don't think it's just a Disney problem. I think it's studios in general. Um, there's a there's a podcaster that I, or a couple of podcasters that I follow called the Cinephiles, and Steve Morris is fond of saying uh, that there are great movies that ruined Hollywood, mm -hmm. um, and he talks about how you know some of these really really big tentpole pictures, even though they're fantastic films, they've started ruining Hollywood and the Hollywood system because right now all the studios want to do is push large big big budget movies with IP. Yeah. They put tons of money behind it. And so the studios are rising and falling on these big tent pole blockbuster films that used to cost a fraction of what they do now. And nobody's releasing the smaller films, which is usually where they made uh, the majority of their money. Yeah, absolutely. Cameron, what about you? Are you in on the there's problems with Disney, Disney's diving down, all those things? No, I definitely think it's a industry thing. Um, when you look at the numbers and you see that um, just across the board, everyone is kind of down. Um, whenever you have something like that, it's that's not a Disney problem. That's an everyone problem. And I think with um, I think there is a problem with uh, Disney animation or sorry, Pixar animation marketing. Because, again, with Elemental, Elemental has surpassed where they thought it was going to be given its opening weekend. Um, and most of the people, most of the reviews that I've seen from Elemental, it's, well, when I saw the trailer, I had no desire to see it. But once I walked out the theater, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so glad I went to go see this movie. Um, so I definitely think they have kind of a messaging problem, which is not something that Pixar has really struggled with that much in the past. Um, but it's been a little bit since, I'm trying to think the last one that was out in theaters that they actually had to, like... The last uh, Pixar film? I mean, yeah. it was Elemental. No, before Elemental. Before Elemental? It was Lightyear. Oh, well, but that's franchise. I'm, I'm talking about something, like, outside of, like, a Turning uh, Red or Onward. It would have been, uh, yeah, uh, Turning Red before that and then uh, Soul before that. Soul yeah. and Onward, though, went directly Onward, to Disney+. Yeah. Plus. Yeah. So that didn't, well, I wouldn't no, necessarily Onward, count those. Onward was in theaters. Onward was in theaters. That was the last um, movie that Very we saw before, yeah, you're right. before everything shut down. 
Oh, I remember Onward going direct. To, I, I thought it did because I didn't see it until we No, I remember. I, I sat okay. in the theater crying. <laughs> right. Well, and they, they brought it out pretty quickly as a, we know that everybody's stuck at home. Let's yes. all watch that together. Yes. So, Got it. It was in theaters very, for a very brief period of time. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's, that makes sense. Um, and okay. That's, that's good. But so, and, and so you're saying Cameron, basically part of the marketing, because one of the things, one of the biggest criticisms, criticisms people have had about Elemental is that it was marketed as a kind of a rom-com kind of something that we've seen before. Yeah. You felt like there was this big twist in Elemental they, where it came to. They uh, missed the mark. Immigrants. They, tell, tell entirely. Me. I mean, to have that movie be released on Father's Day weekend, and, like, that's a gift. That that was a gift that yeah. no one, I don't, I'm not going to say no one. There was probably somebody who was like, we're doing the wrong thing. This is not how we should be marketing this. But it should have been pitched as, you know, this is that father-daughter story. Because really, at that's the story that everyone was really talking about. It's not a, oh, rom-com. This no, is... that's what gave it its legs. Like, Elemental has had really good legs of lasting longer than people, you know, as far as dropping. It hasn't dropped as far as people thought it would. It's because of that story. It's because yeah. of the immigrant story. It's because of the father-daughter story. It's yes. because of all of those things. Absolutely. So, yeah, that makes sense. Um, biggest problem with Disney... My my thing is that, so and and we've already said right there's there's no real problem with Disney. Disney is actually doing very well, uh, especially in in the market that we have now. The biggest problem with Disney, in my opinion, is that they're spending way too much money on their properties. Um, you look at something like uh, John Wick, right? John Wick on a budget of a hundred k made four hundred and twenty six thousand. 427,000 basically. Uh, and if you, if you look at the movie that's right above that for 2023, you have Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Ant-Man and the Wasp, $200 million to make. Now, we're gonna say anything that, that um, doubled its, its budget, because you gotta pay for marketing, you gotta pay for all that stuff. Anything that doubled its budget, we're gonna call it a success. But even though Ant-Man and the Wasp was a success, right? They made, let me see here on my thing, 2.3 times their budget, right? Ant-Man and the Wasp made 2.3. John Wick for 100K made, or for 100 million, made four times its budget. So I just, when it comes to some of these things of Disney spending, Disney spending all of these gobs of money on things, you know, I, I just wonder how. <laughs> Some of me wonders how. When Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is coming in at 100K, and then you're seeing something like Elemental coming out at 200K, how is, how is that possible? Ele Elemental still hasn't made its money back. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, six times its budget, has made $660 million. So think... wait, hold on. Hold on. Hold that thought, because I want to go to Ed, because he talked about budgets first. Ed, what are you thinking about some of these budgets that are coming out from Disney? Well, Hollywood loves loves to play with numbers, and I don't think the num I truly I believe that the numbers that we see or that they put out are not real numbers. I think I think that their budgets are inflated. Uh, well, for instance, uh, uh, in Dallas there used to be a movie studio called Los Colinas, and we went and toured this studio. And at Los Colinas, they had the set from. Uh, JFK. They had spent millions and millions of dollars to recreate the Oval Office for JFK. Well, they created this Oval Office and then they used it in 20, 30 different movies. And every one of those movies said, yeah, we spent millions of dollars to recreate the Oval Office. So I know that there's some fuzzy math in there somewhere. <laughs> and budgets have just been so inflated. And I don't think that that's due to the writers and the actors and even the special effects people really getting their share of what these movies are making. Don't get me wrong there, but uh, Disney used to have a philosophy that you put out a, a good, decent-sized movie uh, 
for an Ant for Ant Man and the Wasp or a Marvel movie or a Disney movie or a, a, a Star Wars movie or something like that. A, a tentpole picture, and for every one of those, you put out about four smaller pictures that were made for n dirt. They were made for dirt. They were dirt cheap, and yep. those movies would become very successful. That's how you got your Pretty Woman's and your Down and Out in Beverly Hills and all these movies in the '90s that really built the studios back up from where they were on the verge of bankruptcy. And they're just not doing it and doing that anymore. They're not releasing these smaller, independent films that make that kind of money. They're just yeah. not doing it. Okay, Cameron, what what do you got? I'll, I'll go to you. Oh well, I also think it's one of those things where there's it's the illusion that growth is like constant, and so like. They last year was a great year for movie studios, um, but with a dip this year, and everyone is feeling that dip. Like all across all studios, they're feeling that dip. They're like, "Well, what's going on? What's going on? What are we doing? What are we doing?" We thought like last year we did these numbers. This year, why aren't we doing more numbers? Well, it, it's not as like again. It's one of those things where. Um, and you're kind of seeing it in the travel industry as well. It's where everyone was inside for such an amount of time. And then it was like, hey, you can come outside. And then everyone was like, oh, I'm going to yeah. go outside, I'm outside, I'm outside. Look at me, I'm outside, I'm outside, I'm outside. And then it's like, oh, well, we've been outside. Okay. Yeah, we've been outside. Like, it's okay. We've been outside. But like, no, no, no. Remember, we're outside. We're outside. Like, no, we've we've been outside. We don't need to go see every single movie. in the th <laughs> No, we're outside. <laughs> Yeah, no, totally get it. Um, but I think there's another aspect here when it comes to spending too much money, because I agree that we're not doing, we're not giving the money to the, the writers. We're not giving them, which by the way, um, we, we definitely should be paying more for residuals. As I've learned more about the, the stock, the, uh, strike that's going on, the, you know, stag out after, like, there is definitely more we can do when it comes to streaming for residuals. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, like your work, um, if your work has some sort of profit sharing or some sort of bonus that exists, if your company does well, most of the companies I've worked for have had some sort of thing like that. Think of it the same way. If your movie does well, you get residuals based off of the success of that movie, at the success of that TV show. Um, from what I've seen, the Friends actors, even after the show ended, we're breaking in millions and millions of dollars in residuals. That is great for them, but it doesn't happen for most people. It doesn't happen for most actors. So for some people, what I've been seeing is the residuals, um, the residuals actually pay the bills in, in some cases for right. the actors and writers and things like that. However, I still go back to Disney spending way too much money on their content. When you look at something like Turning Red or Onward or things like that, for Onward, they probably couldn't know how how things were going to change, especially since it came out so close to the pandemic. Um, but Onward, and I forgot, Cameron and Ed, y'all live in Texas, which is why you probably got to go to the movie theater to see Onward. Um, no, this <laughs> whereas... was literally right before, right before yeah, everything yeah, shut down. for y'all. For y'all, right? Like for for the rest of the country, it was like we've been shut down for three weeks already. So, so that's all I'm saying. But um, spending 142 million dollars on onward, spending 175 million on turning red, you're not leaving very much room for those uh, residuals. You're not leaving very much room for certain things. And even though Disney streaming, I, I looked up a lot of stuff recently, but even though Disney streaming is making $7 billion over a year, uh, when you talk about residuals, when you talk about the content that they're making specifically for Disney, um, Mandalorian, the, the, um, the season for Mandalorian was more than $100 million. The season for Andor was more than $200 million. When you're doing all of that for your streaming platform and not really necessarily knowing how all the money's coming in, yeah, you're going to lose money. That's just, well, just facts. And I think they, everyone saw what Netflix was doing and was like, well, I want to be Netflix. 
but they didn't recognize that Netflix's power was not in, oh, their original content. It was just so good. Their power was in like, hey, y'all aren't doing anything with this. How about we give you this money and we'll put this on our platform and then people can treat me like, well, I wasn't doing anything with it before. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Take this. And now (laughs) people are seeing like, okay, we have this streaming service and people want content and we have the stuff that we did in the past, but now we need to make more content. Like that's why most of Netflix content is reality TV. Cause it's cheap. Like, right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Or the period most dramas. Popular Netflix stuff is reality TV. It's cheap. Lots and that's documents. what, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, so it's not a, I think everyone saw streaming from Netflix as this cash cow, but even Netflix hadn't really figured out like, okay, how are we going to, how, what are we going to, how are we doing this? What are we doing? (laughs) Okay. Stream it, stream it. Like no one knows, but somebody else was doing it. So they're like, okay, we have to do it. You're absolutely right. And it's, it's a good point. And I'm glad you brought up Netflix and I'm in the streaming services. And we've talked about the pandemic a little, you know, there's, there are so many, things that have converged over the past few years uh, that have changed the way that people go to the movies. People do not go to the movies like they used to anymore. Um, We used to always be there opening night, and that's not Mm. always the case that you you have to be in a theater opening night anymore. And I personally haven't been to an opening night since Uh, pre-pandemic. With with my health issues, I don't go to a crowded theater anymore. I wait for yeah. the Tuesday afternoon when it's just going to be me and my son sitting in there, and we're usually the only ones in there. And sometimes yeah. I can do that on a Friday afternoon, the day that it comes out, because of the yeah. way that people are going to the movies now. And streaming services and the pandemic has completely changed the game, and the studios have not adapted to that at all. Yeah, I want to go back to, to what you said, Cameron, because I think that the difference between Netflix and so many of these other streaming surface, services is that to borrow a line from Queen of Catway, Net or Disney, you know, uh, 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 Paramount, all all these ones, they are running for a meal, right? But Netflix is running for its life. <clears throat> Netflix has nothing else. They don't have movies. They release in studios. They don't have parks. They don't have anything else. They do one thing. And so they look at it as we do one thing and we better do it well. And if you think about the content, exactly what you're talking about, Cameron, how many, how many, um, uh, like big budget, uh, you know, the boys like Amazon Prime has that, that you're trying to do? How many Star Wars things are you trying to do? And it's interesting because last week, you mentioned, you, Cameron, mentioned independent films. And I wanted to look up the, the most successful independent films we have. Here's the 10, top 10 independent films uh, uh, that have ever you know been made. One, Passion of the Christ. Two, Untouchables. Three, Dances with Wolves. Four, The King's Speech. Slumdog Millionaire. My Big Fat Greek Wedding. American Beauty. Black Swan. Seven, Silence of the Lambs. Not a single one of those is a animated film or a um, big budget block so- box office sort of things. These people are making their money on exactly what you were talking about, Ed. Like if I look at the things that Disney has really made money on without investing a ton, you're talking about the McFarland USAs. You're talking about the Christopher Robbins and the, you know, not A Wrinkle in Time. A Wrinkle in Time was, A Wrinkle in Time is a perfect example. A Wrinkle in Time is like their one movie where they were like, let's spend a hundred million dollars on this and let's get Reese Witherspoon and Oprah and all these things. And it was like, <laughs> yeah, you could have spent a lot less on that. Uh, Pete's Dragon. on the planet right now. Let's get Ava DuVernay. Let's uh, right. <laughs> pack this movie with everything. Yeah, and that's my thing. Like, one, one <clears throat> I got a lot. I got a lot, actually. Because, one, right now Disney is treating streaming as an afterthought. People don't believe that because of all the content they're throwing at it. But really, uh, when you're letting uh, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 
sit in movie theaters for longer and longer and longer and longer and longer. I know you don't want to upset the movie theaters, but an August 2nd release date for Guardians of the Galaxy 3, to me, does not make sense. You should push that into movie theaters if you want to, and then get that onto your streaming service. That's where you're going to get people subscribing and wanting to see movies and things like that. If it is an afterthought for Disney, it's going to be an afterthought for the audience. Um, and then I think, absolutely, you have to stop doing these big budget things. Like, you just, if you're going to make a, a lot for, um, if you're going to make a lot for, for Disney+, Plus, I don't believe the the world according to Jeff Blow Goldblum and some of that. I don't, I don't think that those are the staying power things. I think your period, like, I'd love to see if you broke up William Tecumseh Sherman, Sherman's life over a certain period of time, I'd love to see that. And that would not have to cost a lot of money at all. Um, you know, that would be the Yellowstone. We considered subscribing to whatever Yellowstone's on. I can't remember. Um, I can't remember because I convinced my wife not to do it. But <laughs> uh, we considered subscribing just for Yellowstone. Um, right now, my wife is upset at me because I really don't want to get Netflix because we used to steal it. But she really wants Netflix uh, so that she can watch Bridgerton. Did um, you steal it or you... And I borrowed it without asking. Okay. Um, <laughs> but she wants to watch Bridgerton. She wants to watch Working Moms. These are two... Working Moms, to my knowledge, doesn't have a single like A-list actor in it. Um, Bridgerton, to my knowledge, for the most part, when it started, I don't think it had an A-list actor in it. Like, same no. with Downton Abbey, same with some of these other ones. So, like, Disney, the formula is there. I'm, and yeah, we're we're past twenty minutes, but final thought. I want final thoughts because we're going to do another episode after this where we dive into each studio. We're going to dive into Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, all of that stuff. Uh, Cameron, final thoughts. We'll start with you. Uh, final thoughts is just that they really need to look at um, using the budget that they have for um, the budget that they use for their streaming. They need to look at maybe doubling that for their movies instead of like these $200 million movies. Because like um, most of the movies that they're making on their that Disney's making on their streaming service are like 36 million, maybe close to 50 million, maybe. Um, and I think they could easily double that um, and make a good movie. Like, so it, I don't know why they're not doing that. Just spend less money and they'll make more. <laughs> all right, Ed, what do you got? I could, I could probably go all night telling you the names of movies that are uh, good stories that are well told that just did not cost a lot of money. And that's what they need to get back to. The money Throwing money at something does not free up creativity. Sometimes spending a lot of money on something hinders creativity. And I think that they need to rein in those budgets and re-look at the way that they're, they're spending their money in order to get these movies to the theater. And once those movies start becoming more profitable, then I think that they'll be able to shift that paradigm. But for right now, uh, spending hundreds of million dollars on a movie and releasing as many movies as they release each year, it's just it's just not going to cut it. Yeah. Um, I, and I completely agree with you. I do also want to say, like, even if you think these things are not a success, uh, even if you think certain movies like i'm trying to do two things at once here <laughs> even if you think certain movies that came out were not a success even if you think that you didn't like them even if you think that there was uh there we go um even if you think that there was like bad movies there i just need to let you know this because uh this is what we're going to go out on gardens of the galaxy volume three made 3.3 times its budget Little Mermaid make two times its budget. Uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp, 2.3 times its budget, 2.4 times its budget. Elemental, Indiana Jones, those are the two that are, that are struggling. Indiana Jones hasn't even come close to finishing its, its movie theater run, so let's give it some time and see what it does. 
Um, but you're talking about three out of the five movies that Disney is making, making excess of 50, 70, hundreds of million dollars more than they cost to make. Um, so you look at some of the other ones uh, from last year, Doctor Strange, Black Panther, Love and Thunder. I didn't even like Love and Thunder. And it made three times its budget in the movies. So <clears throat> Disney is doing okay. You should take that as as one takeaway from this episode. But the other thing, and I think the thing that we really need to, to think about is what are the movies that Disney is putting out there? Who are they for? Who is your audience? Because like I said, like we've been talking about, they don't need to spend nearly as much money as they are on a lot of these things. I really think Disney needs to get back to its core audience and really figure out what they need to spend money on and where they send it. Because right now it feels like they're just throwing spaghetti against the wall with their the Marvel stuff, the Star Wars stuff, whatever they can find. Disney Disney uh, pictures just kind of recycling uh, what the animated studios have done 20 years ago. Uh, they're just throwing stuff against the wall. Uh, and I think if they get back to what they're supposed to be doing, I think they'll start to see more success, um, even in the financial area. So... That's going to be this episode. Ooh, we did it in like 27 minutes, which is great. Next episode, we are going to go into the Disney Studios, look at them, and see uh, what, what we do to fix them. So, yeah, tune into that one.